couldn't resist coming back to chair a, a panel entitled violence and the politics of splatter it's right up my street or the papers are right up my street as well and it's no accident that i've been invited to chair this one and i also like that it's panel 13 that seems particularly uh, uh, appropriate and um, today we've got three papers presented by four speakers obviously you know the format by now it's uh, that we'll have the papers and then we'll have time for questions at the end so remember to post any questions that you have uh, into the chat and we'll pick those up uh, as we go along. Um, our next speaker is Meg Lonergan, uh, who is a PhD candidate in legal studies at Carlton University in Ottawa. Uh, her doctoral research, which I should know well, uh, since I'm one of the supervisors, examines obscenity law after the Supreme Court ruling of Ro, um, I'm sorry, R. V. Butler 1992. And the uh, social legal governance of the obscene, um, extreme, and objectionable content in Canada more broadly. Uh, as a cultural criminologist, Meg's research interests span critical criminology, horror studies, porn studies, research ethics, and qualitative methods. Um, Meg's paper is titled True North, Strong and Obscene Mapping the Snuff Mythos in Canadian Law Post Butler. Great, thanks, Steve. Can you hear and see me? Sorry. Oh, yeah, I can see them now. Okay, perfect. So hello, everyone. Uh, like Steve said, my name is Meg Lonergan. I'm a PhD candidate in legal studies with a specialization in political economy at Carleton University in Ottawa. My talk today, True North, Strong and Obscene, Mapping the Snuff Mythos in Canadian Obscenity Law Post Butler, is an overview of an article I'm currently working on for an interdisciplinary justice journal and is based on my dissertation research. The abstract that I proposed for this conference was an exploration of the relationship between the snuff film mythos and obscenity law in Canada. And in particular, I focus on the post Butler era, which is from 1992 onward. And I'll explain my, my choice of scope as we move along. In this presentation, I will give a brief overview of what the snuff mythos is. Although this audience is probably quite familiar with snuff films, in stark contrast to the lawyers and legal scholars I normally present to, uh, a brief overview of Canadian obscenity law, anti-porn feminism, the Butler decision, my theoretical framework of hauntology, and I'll include, so I conclude by wrapping up my thesis that the Snuffle mythos is still haunting Canadian obscenity law. The snuff mythos was born in the 1970s with some scholars tying it to the rumor that after the murder of Sharon Tate and her guests by the Manson family, that the family had used Roman Polanski's film equipment to film the torture and murders. While others tie it to the 1976 release of the horror film Snuff, which purported to claim, sorry, purported to contain the real murder of an actress in the film. Thus the snuff film has three main criteria. First and foremost, a snuff film must include a real murder of a human being. Most often this is imagined to be a murder culminating uh, a pornographic film and is highly gendered with the presumed victim as a woman, but also sometimes as a child. Secondly, that the snuff film is created for the purpose of arousal of the audience and that this arousal is usually associated specifically with sexual arousal. This then excludes tapes of real murders, such as terrorist beheading videos or surveillance footage from crime scenes. It's understood that the combination of sex and violence is the source of stimulation. And lastly, that the snuff film is commercially made. The historical origins of the snuff film, particularly as perpetuated by anti-porn feminists, was that there was an underground part of the adult film industry making these films and selling them for profit. This further lends condemnation not only to the moral corruptness of violence against women, but also the exploitation for profit under capitalism. Anti-porn feminism is central to my paper, not only for understanding the snuff film mythos, but also for understanding Canadian obscenity law, as anti-porn feminism is really a cornerstone of both ideas and a bridge between them. Virtually all of the major radical feminists or anti-porn liberal feminists, from Gloria Steinem to Catherine McKinnon, have made claims about how they know snuff films to be real, although they often refer to friends of friends as the ones who have seen the snuff films for themselves. What's particularly been frustrating in my research is the lack of sources for these claims that they make about snuff, and I'm happy to take questions and rant about this in the question period. 
but as a politically strategic discourse, this makes a lot of sense as snuff films are the perfect example of pornography as violence against women because they're literally killing women to make these movies and demonstrating the media effects theory that men will need harder or more violent in extreme porn uh, the more they consume, escalating to committing acts of violence themselves. Anti-porn feminism in both the US and Canada were organized with strange bedfellows, teaming up with white right-wing conservatives and religious groups to lobby against porn. Now that we've gone over a brief backstory of snuff, which you're mostly probably familiar with, I'll really briefly summarize obscenity law in Canada, which is probably less familiar to many of you. I've put the section 163 of the criminal code outlining the offense on the slide, but what's really important is subsection eight. So the criminal offense of obscenity in Canada is every person commits an offense who print, makes, prints, publishes, distributes, circulates, or has in their possession for the purpose of publication, distribution, or circulation, any obscene written matter, picture, model, phonograph, record, or other obscene thing. Every person commits an offense who knowingly without lawful justification or excuse sells, exposes to public view, or has in their possession for that purpose, any obscene written matter, picture, model, phonograph, record, or any other obscene thing, or publicly exhibits a disgusting object or an indecent show. And again, subsection A, which defines obscene material, is for the purposes of this act, any publication, a dominant characteristic of which is the undue exploitation of sex, or of sex in any one or more of the following subjects, namely crime, horror, cruelty, and violence shall be deemed to be obscene. So that's the definition we're working with in the legal context in Canada. Which brings us to R.B. Butler, the Supreme Court ruling on the constitutionality of the obscenity provisions in 1992. An adult video store owner in Winnipeg was charged with distributing obscenity and challenged the law as a violation of the Section 2B charter right, which is the right to freedom of expression. Anti-porn feminists uh, Catherine McKinnon helped the Legal Education Action Fund, known as LEAF, uh, the major legal feminist organization in Canada, to get official intervener status in the case. And their intervener's document is very similar to the Supreme Court's ruling, and legal scholars have widely commented on their influence on the decision. The court ruled that while the obscenity provisions are a violation of Section 2B of the Charter. It can be saved under Section 1, which is the notwithstanding clause, which guarantees all of the rights and freedoms in the Charter, except where it can be justified in a free and democratic society, which is super bizarre. And I'm also happy to talk about that um, in the question period if people are like, that's the most bizarre way of doing uh, protecting rights in a legal framework that they've ever heard of. On the basis of criminalizing obscenity, they argue that it's not about morality, but rather it's about criminalizing obscenity to prevent harm, particularly harm against respect for human sexuality and preventing violence against women. And this is sort of, I mean, it's, it's basically hypocritical because they say that it's not about morality, but this section still appears in the section of the criminal call, code called offenses tending to corrupt morals. And so it's not about morality despite clearly being about morality. And allow me to pivot here to introduce my theoretical framework, which is hauntology. Not only does hauntology work thematically in a paper about the myth of snuff films and horror, but also because with the mythos of the snuff film is not always explicit in Canadian obscenity law, but there are traces there. The ghosts of the snuff film, which has never been proved to exist in the first place, haunts both the prosecution of content as obscenity and the continued existence of the criminal code provisions themselves. As Derrida writes, haunting is a question of repetition. A specter is always a revenant. One cannot control its comings and goings because it begins by coming back. There's a socio-legal fear that despite snuff films are not real, that they could be real that whether the porn industry pushes too far or perhaps, or more likely, content creators online continue to push the boundaries of the content available online, and we'll return to this idea momentarily. More so than Derrida, my work builds on Avery Gordon's use of hauntology in her book, Ghostly Matters. The snuff film mythos has acted and continues to act in both its capacity as an urban legend and as a ghost story. Again, despite not being real, this 
myth of the snuff film is real in its material effects, particularly its influence of Canadian obscenity law. So when you examine obscenity case law from 1992 to 2020, you can see two concurrent shifts in the data. There's a shift from cases involving vice raids on adult video stores and prosecuting VHS tape pornographic films in the 1990s to prosecuting online horror sites that contain sexualized content. So on this slide, you can see cases involving adult video stores or porn production companies on the left, uh, including Hawkins, Ronish, and Jorgensen, who took their case to the Supreme Court like Butler, and they challenged uh, their conviction on the basis that they had actually submitted the porn videos available in their store to the provincial film rating boards for approval, um, but were still charged with obscenity anyways. The Supreme Court overruled the lower courts because they had shown due diligence to ensure the films were in fact legal in Canada. Herbidus is uh, in the middle because he ran an online message board where anyone could post uh, content and he was held responsible for the content posted, which included uh, both content that was found to be obscene as well as child pornography. And then the last four cases uh, we'll get into more detail on in a minute. But you can see the shift to horror online content and horror content there. So while the 1990s saw obscenity clearly targeting pornography, the 2000s have shifted more to a focus on horror content. And this is also reflected in sort of the snuff tech evolution of popular culture. So on this slide, uh, starting with the top left-hand corner, uh, you can see snuff films or horror films about snuff films uh, that involve eight millimeter film to then films about snuff films uh, on VHS tape as time progresses to then more recent films um, about digital streaming. And then of course, the August Underground trilogy, which embodies this all the way across where the, as the sequels come out, there's a change in the filming technology and the, the sort of film quality or image quality becomes better over time. So not only do we see this in law, we also see this being played out in technological shifts in pop culture. So again, while the 1990s saw obscenity clearly targeting pornography, the 2000s have shifted focus more on horror content that contains sexual elements rather than pornography largely involving S&M and fetish content, which is no longer seen as inher inherently cruel or violent. Between the death of video stores and the ubiquity of internet porn, it truly would no longer make sense to keep targeting these stores. However, I argue that, that because of the snuffle mythos has now evolved into a digital context, there's fear regarding online horror content being authentic depictions of sexual violence. Elsewhere, I've written about how often fictional violence or gore looks more real than authentic depictions because we're so used to the excessive visuals in filmmaking. Indeed, the two most recent obscenity cases in Canada were prosecutions for an authentic recording of a murder and dismemberment of a human being in Canada in 2012. Luca Magnata was of course also charged with a slew of other criminal offenses, including first degree murder, but also for creating and distributing obscene content under section 163 of the criminal code. Mark Merrick, the owner of bestware.com was subsequently charged for distributing the video on his website. In 2018, the liberal government repealed so-called zombie laws referring to laws that are rarely used or enforced in Canada from the criminal code. While sections surrounding the obscenity provisions were repealed, including crime comics and advertising sexual virility, obscenity was not up for consideration. This may be because people still do believe in the myth or of or the eventuality of snuff films. This was not at all helped by Magnata producing one of the closest things to a real snuff film in Canadian history. Interestingly, interestingly while both Magnata and his victim were queer men, Magnata had previously worked in the sex industry, including in adult films, and had attempted to become a reality TV star, two industries most, most commonly associated with the snuff mythos, especially in popular culture. Well, nearly 30 years ago, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the obscenity provisions in the name of protecting the integrity of human sexuality, protecting women's equality and women from actual instances of violence. It is not clear how less than 20 cases being prosecuted 
a quarter of which ended up at the Supreme Court, and about half of which ended in convictions achieved any of those goals. Further, it is not reasonable that either pornographic films or fictional horror content be prosecuted under the same provisions that are used for the distribution of the real murder and dismemberment of a human being. The Supreme Court of Canada should recognize the need for a legal distinction between playing dead and being dead when it comes to obscenity. We cannot remain haunted by the ghosts of anti-porn feminism or the specter of snap films. So in the meantime, while we wait for another case to provoke a Supreme Court decision, um, which could be a very long time as they recently declined to hear a similar uh, case based on fictional or child porn, the ambiguity of obscenity provisions remains and it's really unclear both in the criminal code definition and in the subsequent precedents, what content is criminalized as it's seen in Canada, how police investigate obscenity, and how Crown prosecutors decide which cases to pursue, and how juries that are often um, the preference for Crown prosecutors in obscenity cases, how those juries make those decisions. And that's my talk. Thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thank you, Meg. Um, I, there's some questions that have already started coming in um, in, into the comments for you. As a reminder to everyone, uh, do feel free to drop questions uh, into the chat and, and we'll pick those up after our third paper. And without further ado, our third paper our th third paper is presented by two presenters. Uh, the first is uh, Eloyd Cardozo, who's an independent researcher based out of Mumbai. Uh, his previous work has appeared in peer-reviewed journals such as Cine J Cinema Journal, uh, Economic and Political Weekly, and Global Hip Hop Studies. And that's, that's the piece of uh, research that I'm most familiar with of, uh, of around um, um, hip hop in Bombay. Um, Aditi um, Kandelwal is a second year postgraduate student um, at Mithabai College of the Arts in Mumbai, and she's enthusiastic about French existentialist literature and magical realism. And their combined paper, which is uh, obviously, I was about to say close to my heart, but it's probably close to a different one of my bodily organs thinking about uh, the topic, is called Come See, See and Come, uh, Tom Six's Aesthetic of Offence. So I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, before I begin, I would just like to give a quick shout out to Daniel and Wickham for putting this conference together. Uh, this is an idea which has been germinating and fermenting for quite a while. So this conference is the perfect excuse for us to start working on it. And it is now starting to take some shape. Uh, I'm going to switch off my camera to avoid bandwidth issues and share my screen. Can you please tell me if it's visible and if you can hear, if it's visible for now. So our paper is called uh, Come and See, See and Come, Tom Six's Aesthetics of Offense. Uh, the rough layout of our presentation is we are going to start by speaking about uh, the human centipede and the comparisons which have been made between the human centipede films and uh, the Italian Mondo films. Uh, from there, I'll go on to discussing the body horror of the human centipede one and two. Before, uh, after that, I'll go on to discuss uh, Steve Jones's conception of strategic repulsion, and I'll try and contend that uh, in uh, Analyzing Tom Six's work, this conception can be taken uh, taken beyond representations of corporeality. Uh, after that, I'll speak about Tom Six's position as a controversial filmmaker before discussing his stance on political correctness. Uh, after which, Aditi will take over and speak about aesthetics and decadence and the abuse of beauty before finally making the concluding remarks. So, uh, Tom Six's uh, Human Centipede trilogy is infamous for being, in the words of Rebecca Hawks, uh, deliberately shocking and unashamedly viscerally disgusting. She points out how Adrian Smith draws a parallel between these films and the Italian Mondo films of the 60s and 70s, in that their real aim is to amuse, titillate and shock. Uh, Gino Moliterno lays out the basic uh, structure of a Italian Mondo film as a series of ironic juxtapositions, which on the surface seem arbitrary but which in reality were tightly governed by a logic of contiguity. The films mixed together reality with, uh, were tightly governed by a logic of, I'm sorry, the films mixed together scenes of banality and brutality, civilized customs and savage rituals, uh, sexual titillation and religious fanatism. Uh, Mark Goodall remarks that these Mondo films are always inviting us, the audience, to look and be repelled by what we see. Goodall's observation points out how in Mondo films, uh, the shock 
almost always comes from visual on screen horror and violence and it is here that we contend that one of the crucial differences between the human centipede films and the mondo films reveals itself so uh, speaking of the body horror in the human centipede 1 and 2 uh, the human centipede films uh, central premise is the surgical attachment of experimental subjects mouth to anus so they share a digestive tract to form the eponymous creature from the film's titles the first film in the franchise uh, sees dr joseph heiter a german surgeon who specializes in separating conjoined twins abduct and carry out his experiment on two american women and a japanese man discussing the film uh, nikita patterson suggests that the entire shock value rests in its central concept with the plot story arc and imagery obviously obvious from the trailer let alone its title the first film even for all of its corporeal shock that it draws on including scatological horror as well as serious physical mutilation is relatively reserved when it comes to the on screen graphic details of this body horror the, the second film titled the human centipede 2 full sequence uh, screened in black and white seriously ups the ante with very graphic depictions of um, mutilation physical and sexual violence as well as scatological horror uh, which are littered in an escalating fashion throughout the film it sees martin lomax uh, a parking lot attendant who is obsessed with the first film abduct over a dozen of people before ultimately creating a 10 person long human centipede as opposed to dr heiter in the first film martin lacks any surgical know how and simply attaches the individuals in his rendition of the centipede using a staple gun without any anesthesia while heiter was depicted as a deprived scientist uh, martin's obsession it is implied comes from the sexual abuse he suffered as a child steve jones argues that in these films tom six employs uh, what he calls strategic repulsion in that he demonstrates how controversy can be strategically generated to create meanings that are overlooked by those who disavow such content by by uh, thwarting attempts to fix their meaning via discourses of repulsion since critical vilification constitutes the series of uh, the series meaning in doing this jones discusses the dynamics between corporeal disgust and the critical rejection of the human centipede films uh, we argue that in taking a panoramic view of six's work this idea of strategic repulsion can be extended beyond corporeality to incorp to incorporate how he evokes uh, repulsion at perceivably offensive content that isn't necessarily corporeal while the first film's shock value rests mostly in the central concept of the human centipede and the second film's that in its graphic display of these horrors the third film in the franchise is where our hypothesis first begins to take shape in the third film uh, uh, as opposed to the first two where the antagonists motivations for constructing the human centipede have very little to do with their unsuspecting victims uh, the third and final film sees this surgical conjoining used as a form of punishment steve joins points out in context of the first two films how certain sensorial argumentation presumes that films like the human centipede negatively impact on their viewership celebrating rather than questioning the antagonist's motives as opposed to the first two films where the antagonists conjoin largely quote unquote innocent victims into a larger human centipede in the third film a prison warden in america named bill boss is convinced by his accountant come assistant dwight butler who is inspired by the first two films into ordering the making of a human of a 500 person human centipede by conjoining all the prisoners as a form of punishment for their notoriously disrespectful and erratic behavior steve com and kevin walby have pointed out how the boss's familial roots in bavaria as well as his heavy german accent and obsession with authority forge intertextual links to the first sequence which is the first film in the franchise and provide a historical cultural point of reference connecting american carceral punishment with fascism and the atrocities of nazi germany while it has been revealed that uh, joseph heiter's character in the first film is inspired from joseph mengel a german a doctor and war criminal who conducted medical experiments including the forcible sewing together of twins to make them conjoin the political commentary in the third film is much more explicit as opposed to the first two films although it is it also has several satirical tones to it uh, 
And it is perceived to be also offensive given that it com comments on contemporary American, uh, the com I'm sorry, the contemporary American prison system. Comparing this film to other prison movie tropes, uh, Comb and Wolby further point out how these prisoners are perceived as the enemies of the United States. I quote, as racialized outsiders to the cultural and religious heartland of the nation. While Bill Boss is a caricature of the cinematic Texas prison warden. Paired with Boss's sexual exploitation of his secretary and his frequent use of racial slurs, as well as the fact that the governor calls the human centipede as a form of punishment a genius idea, it is very clear that as opposed to the first two films, the third film's strategic repulsion is not entirely corporeal. In fact, the violence depicted in the second film is arguably much more extreme, as Tom Six himself has uh, confessed, that as a parallel to the middle position in the human centipede being the most distressing, with both one's mouth as well as anus attached to another human being. Uh, the third film then, when it comes to body horror, unlike the first two, in painting neither the creator of the human centipede as obsessed with the creature, nor the victims as necessarily morally superior to the perpetrators, foregrounds questions of moral and political degeneration in a manner that is designed expressively to repulse. Six, as a filmmaker, is very aware of this as the branding of the third film, like you can see on your screen, called 100% politically incorrect. Uh, before proceeding, we would like to discuss briefly uh, Tom Six's self-branding as a controversial filmmaker. To begin with, The Human Centipede as a trilogy is very meta-narrative and self-referential, with the second film positioning the first one as fictional and the third one positioning the first two as fictional, in both cases to serve as the antagonist sources of inspiration. The third film, in the words of Tom Six, is like a satire on the prison system. The satire, however, is not just restricted to its commentary on the prison system, but towards the film trilogy in and of itself, as well as the criticism and censorship that it has been subjected to over several years. In discussing a scene in the film where prisoners are shown the first two films to prepare them for what's going to happen to them, Com and Walby point out, I quote, the scene draws humor through its inversion of our expectations, that hardened prisoners who are brutalized, violent, and ready to enact death rape would be offended by the fantasy body horror of Human Centipede 1 and 2 is, rep is presented I'm sorry, as irony in an effort to address the critics and censors who Six deems unnecessary and misaligned with contemporary values. In his tongue-in-cheek satire on the perceived ludicrousness of the first two films being deemed harmful to society, it is very evident that Six thrives in antagonizing the critics of his work. A quick look at his Twitter uh, feed, which grabs of which I have put on your screen, uh, are enough to point out that he prides himself in the controversial and polarizing nature of his films. When asked about it at a film screening, he said, I quote, if you vomit out your breakfast, it's like a standing ovation to me. Also, if you run away or whatever, that you can't handle it, I love it. I love horror reactions. This reminds me a bit of the Argentine filmmaker Gaspar Noe, who expressed disappointment with how few people walked out during the screenings of his most recent film, Climax. Six revels in the fact that his films offend people, and his work, in fact, seems more similar to Noe, and whom, who has been called one of the few people to spark the onset of the new French extremity, than it is uh, to the Italian Mondo films. Uh, West describes no cinema as one of confrontation and disruption, where the status quo is continually and violently challenged. Six's confrontation and disruption of the status quo, we argue, comes from a head-on tackling of, what, of questioning what is and isn't politically correct through the very act of making films that are deemed as offensive or politically incorrect. Uh, going to the next part. Uh, we point out here that our readings of the idea of political correctness are simultaneously informed and restricted by our lived realities in the middle class society of Mumbai, a metropolitan city in the developing South Asian country of India. According to Muriel Diamond, the idea of politically correct grows naturally from moral judgments, which any political ideology or philosophy contains that deems certain aspects of the present way of living bad. We contend that the dominant discourses of political correctness, sometimes if not always, become instruments to fuel cultural elitism as well as being representative of an immense sociocultural privilege. Uh, for an example, 
A person that doesn't have the cultural competence to identify their language or behavior as racist or sexist could often end up finding themselves socially excluded when interacting with those who have had the cultural capital as well as privilege to formulate an understanding of what racism or sexism is. Tom Six tackles this issue head on, which is best evidenced in his upcoming film, The Onania Club, from which I'm very quickly going to play a short clip. If you could tell me whether you can see the, I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to share the video. If you can tell me whether you can see and hear, that will be great. back to this, Tom Six describes the Onania Club uh, as a pitch black satire. Quite simply put, the film is about a group of white upper class women who form a secret society uh, that gathers and collectively masturbates to the suffering of others. Come and see, see and come, as the film subtitle suggests. According to the trailer, the film is about schadenfreude or the derivation of pleasure from someone else's misfortune. The film, according to reviews, despite not having the usual amounts of on-screen violence Six has now garnered a reputation for, sees him push the limits of how far he has gone to offend people even further. The film houses scenes of this secret society masturbating to real documentary footage of uh, the 9-11 incident as well as an African for mine. Uh, this film, going by reviews, supposedly unfolds in a flashback where a Catholic woman who is troubled by her urges visits a church to confess to a priest. Uh, this narrative technique, we argue, draws an interesting parallel with the Human Centipede 2. In the last scene of the Human Centipede 2, we see the antagonist Martin sitting in his room in the parking lot as the end credits for the Human Centipede 1 roll on the computer screen and we hear the cries of a baby, presumably the same one that was with the first couple he abducted in the film. As Kim Newman points out, what we see might be as much a fantasy as the actual truth. In this, Six seems to be playing on the trope that offense is in fact taken and not given, and it's more than anything in the head of the person that is offended. If the happenings of the film are not even real in the fictional world that they unfold in, and are in fact someone's fantasies, can they really be called offensive? It is here that we will discuss uh, what we conceive as uh, Tom Six's aesthetics of offense, for which I'm going to switch off my mic and uh, hand it over to Aditi so she can take the presentation forward. Hi, thank you, Eloy. All right. So uh, much like Tom Six's films and uh, their audience, aestheticism and decadence as artistic movements shock the Victorian uh, establishment by challenging traditional values, uh, foregrounding sensuality and promoting artistic, sexual and political expectations. Uh, the key idea of these movements was art for art's sake. And central to the decadent movement was the view that art was totally opposed to nature in the sense of both biological nature and the natural norms of the society. A decadent artist cultivates high artifice in style and often the bizarre in subject matter. They recoil from the fecundity and exuberance of the organic nature and uh, deliberately set out to violate what is commonly held to be natural in the human experience by resorting to drugs, deviancy from standard norms of behavior and sexual experimentation in an attempt to achieve what uh, the French poet Arthur Rimbaud called the systematic derangement of all senses. Now, this uh, painting that you see on the screen is, a, is by a celebrated artist called Gustave Klimt, it's called uh, Nuda Veritas or The Naked Truth. Uh, while its self-assured and full frontal nudity seems to challenge certain viewers, the mirror in her hand expresses and emphasizes the me painting's meaning, which is artistic truthfulness without compromise. And the blue serpent at her feet, uh, at the feet of the artistic expression, uh, with its tail 
near her feet shows the inability to comprehend or recognize the truth the inscription at the top of the painting is from zinine a poem by goethe and schiller uh, which was prompted by the indifference and animosity of contemporary criticism tom six is a decadent artist and the vilification of his films the human centipede series and the upcoming onania club by critics and media is not just as steve jones suggests a sensorial prohibition which amounts to unwillingness to engage with its themes but also a complete misunderstanding of its aesthetics as a work of art designed proactively to offend while it is true that six's movies are graphic and shock the out- audience out of their comfort zone using these as arguments to contend that the film was badly made points to a very rudimentary anachronistic and uh, dichotomous understanding of aesthetics in terms of the beautiful and the ugly where the latter represents a complete contradiction of the former such misconceptions occur even after an understanding and acceptance of avant-garde movements like dadaism and surrealism because of the cyclical process of divorce of art and beauty which is immediately followed by a reconciliation due to the normative culture which keeps blurring the perceptions uh eloy can you go to the next slide please uh in the abuse of beauty uh, arthur danto denied beauty a constitutive role in art so art does not have to be beautiful in it he also expressed the fear of such cognitive contamination by the invasive authority of beauty which abuses the human soul and makes beauty the crux of a structured way to value other goods to understand and appreciate six's art then the audience must perceive ugliness in its thematic context dive deep into its layers as a uh, mestel vidrich suggests in the ugliness of the avant-garde look at ugliness as a way to expand the concept of beauty to shape the way in which other art is discussed and produced as eloy previously mentioned there are similarities between tom six and gaspar no movies uh, and this lies in their penchant for the shock induced in the audience nathan taylor pemberton comments on gaspar no as a uh, Call and calls him a provocateur, saying that his films are extraordinary not for the reaction they induce or that we assume he wants to induce, but for their ability to introduce a provoking agent and follow it to its end. And this stands true for Tom Six's art as well. While discussing reactions of those close to Fluxus uh, towards Viennese. actionist art mestel bidrich also points out that the images and gestures of the seemingly anarchic actions of the actionist art pose a challenge for interpretation but the shock value of disgust as kant saw makes these images float uneasily between the representations and the realities they represent this also stands true in case of tom six's films the graphic sequence of which are controlled and carefully orchestrated much like the art of viennese actionists with the shock value of such sequences along with premises that are designed to evoke offense it is tempting and as numerous critics as well as uh, casual viewers have done to be dismissive of these films as nothing more than shock inducing exercises in doing this one runs the risk of carrying out a monochrome reading of these films and completely ignores the possible subtextual layers for instance while the shock factor in a uh, sixes film comes from the central idea of human centipede there is more to unpack which almost never gets addressed at a film screening uh, six discussed how the thematic inspiration behind the first human centipede film was the second world war as previously mentioned that the character of dr yosef heiter was inspired by an ss officer and physician who performed deadly experiments on prisoners at the auschwitz concentration camps in fact the lab coat he wears in the films is an authentic jacket worn by nazi scientists the doctor's costume in the film is often monochromatic white and black and sometimes a combination of the two but no other color the white here can be read as symbolic of nazi obsession with race purity and the black can represent the darkness it casts on the red of the world the rest of the world in this particular scene from uh, 
the human centipede where dr hyter welcomes lindsay and jenny into the into his house a reddish hue can be seen cast on in the room where uh, he offers them water and pretends to call for help uh, this reddish hue in in certain scenes can also be seen sort of merging with the paintings on his wall which uh, show siamese twins in surgeries and it, it's sort of like blood is gushing from these paintings and this can be uh, reflective of his bloody intent Katsuro's uh, favorable position as the head of the human centipede is also representative of the association of Germany and Japan as Axis power. Uh, his inability to free himself from the clutches of Dr. Heiter and his subsequent suicide is a reflection of Germany's power over Japan and is symbolic of the numerous soldiers and civilians who committed harakiri to die an honorable death rather than be captured. in this context the question that katsuro poses at dr hyter asking him if he thinks he is god adds depth to the interpretation the two american girls jenny and lindsay are symbolic of the fate of the americans as the former dies of blood poisoning war and the latter represents the unknown fate of both soldiers and civilians left to pick up the pieces of their shattered world as greg horowitz puts it to see something ugly in fact is already to lift it up to an aesthetic response to judge something ugly is to scorn it even though however repulsive it can do nothing more than offend our perception tom six's decadent art is for art sake it can be perceived as ugly but judging it as ugly is a symptom of attaching political and cultural meanings to it and an inability to separate reality from fiction the rejection of such art as acceptable or even questioning its validity as art then takes away an artist's freedom in the realm of creativity as its critics try to bind restrain and gag the artist their coercive actions are metaphorically not very different from the antagonists of the human centipede series who surgically removes parts that don't fit and kills what doesn't fit fit his design this is this is exactly what is happening with what had happened with the second human centipede film and what is currently happening with the onania club which distributors have refused to touch due to its supposedly controversial content as history has witnessed such aggression does not stand and to appreciate tom six's aesthetics of offense you must come and see and see and come these are the works we have cited and some of our references thank you to all of us speak I need to be right um <laughs> chat and I'll keep my eye on them um uh, appearing in the chat uh while we're talking but I wanted to begin actually with a question that to address to all of our speakers because I think it it's something that's uh, probably important for us to talk about in the context of this uh this um conference being about the slasher film and it's about how we use different terms for genre and subgenres and um, so during the course of all these talks we we've, we've heard a lot of different terms being used for different kinds of um subgenres such as I mean slasher obviously but uh the serial killer film uh snuff splatter mondo exploitation body horror even arguably be torture porn no uh that was you didn't directly mention it but that's um what um Tom Six's films are usually dubbed as. I suppose the one thing that I was wondering on whether you could speak to the, all of you could speak to this is whether you think of these as being distinct subgenres or whether they should be distinct terms or what brings these terms together in a meaningful way. So any thoughts on that would be welcome. So, well, another way of putting it is, why, uh, why are your papers suitable for a conference about the slasher film, particularly? What is the, that has? In, what do, is there in common between all of the, the papers we've heard in this panel? So, I mean, mine's sort of maybe a step back from from some of the other papers, just because I talk about the implications 
for having really poorly dis descriptive law. Um, and so because obscenity is so poorly defined and the precedence is so all over the place and so doesn't actually help sort of limit that definition. Um, in the Canadian context, both for producers and people who want to import foreign slasher films or horror films, it's like very unclear what the legal boundaries are. And so like even in the case I talked about with Jorgensen, who had his films uh, approved by the Ontario Film Board, still received criminal charges for those films because it's a criminal matter, right? So it doesn't, provincial film boards are nice, but they don't actually have any legal authority. Um, and so I don't really know so much about this, the subgenre differentials, probably because I'm not actually a film scholar. Um, but I think looking at the ways that all those subcategories are similar um, is, is sort of a motivating way to get people to, to care about sort of the legal predicament in Canada. Okay, brilliant. If you, did you want to chip in anything, Eloy or Aditi? If not, we'll move on. Uh, I just on. wanted to quickly say uh, this comes from no place of expertise, but given that India has no conception of something called a slasher subgenre of horror, uh, mm -hmm. I believe uh, this need for a distinction comes in when there is a larger body of work produced and people often tend to dub it as something it is not and hate it for something it is not, which is sort of what we have tried to look at with Tom Six's work. That's really interesting. Um, We've got a question for Meg that's come through the chat from old, old Tommy Watson. Um, so it's going to be a, it's going to be a blinder, Meg, because you know uh, Tom's going to pose you a difficult question. Um, how pronounced are the shifts in audiovisual technology in the case law that you've researched? Does this also connect to the framework of hauntology you refer you refer to? Yeah, so they're pretty pretty pronounced, but also putting on my statistical hat probably not statistically significant because the problem with obscenity law is there's only about 17 cases in that 30 year period. And so because it's so disjointed, um, it's hard to make profound comments on that, but it is pretty clear. Um, if I was better with Excel, I thought about making a graph where like, as soon as you hit 2000, it's no longer at all going after porn or VHS. 2000 hits and it switches over to horror content online. Um, so it's pretty pronounced. And sorry, what was the second part of the question? Uh, the second part, I've just lost the, lost the thing now. Uh, oh, how, it, how does it re relate to hauntology? hauntology. It's about how does it relate to hauntology? Oh, God. Um, I haven't really thought that through, but in conversations with Tom, which is probably where this question came from, um that hauntology is really deeply connected to changing technologies um and so that's definitely in there somewhere but it's definitely what keeps the snuff film mythos alive right because it doesn't make sense if it's like the whole reason why they updated the ring movie right like it no longer makes sense if we're relying on this vhs tape as the symbol of doom in the world when nobody except me has a working vhs player a vcr um, students in my class often ask if VHS tapes are the same thing as VCRs or like how that works. And that boggles my mind and it makes me feel old and I'm not even 30 and it makes me feel old. So like, right? So you have to update the technology to remain relevant. And so lots of people um, writing more in like a folk folklore studies kind of part of sociology have looked at the fact that like urban legends have to evolve to stay relevant, right? This is, I'm sure we're gonna see this with the new uh, Candyman movie, right? Like you change to sort of reflect the culture in the moment and that's how urban legends travel and stay relevant. And that's why I think the snuff film mythos is still there. Um, and I'm hoping to do more work on it in my postdoc because all the conversations I've ever had with anybody about my research, people are like, of course, snuff films are real. Um, and even when I worked for the RCMP, people were like, of course, snuff films are real. None of us have ever seen them but we've all heard of somebody who knows somebody whose second cousin saw a snuff film. And that would be fine if that was just sort of ghost stories that go around, but it's ghost stories that then have implications when members of parliament and the police believe that these are real things and a real threat 
um, then they have real consequences in law. You'll be pleased to hear that someone in the on the YouTube comments has just said that they have a VCR. Um, if you come back to Northumbria at any point, if you go into Johnny Walker's office, he's got about like 19 different VCR players in there. He collects them. It's incredible. Oh, it's so uh, cool. We've got a question for Eloy and Aditi from Tosha, who asks, does Six's public persona contribute to the sense of offensiveness surrounding his work? If he styled himself as a more serious auteur, would his films be received differently? I suppose I thought this, a similar thing around the comparisons of the Viennese actionists and thought whether... Six's uses of humour and his marketing prime the audience to see the films as something other than art and whether that's part of the joke, as it were. Do you want to take that one, Aditi? Yeah, yeah. See, uh, Six is a proclaimed decadent artist and decadence revolves more around self-indulgence and not stimulation of other senses. So if he starts taking himself seriously and acts more seriously, it kind of beats the purpose of decadence okay brilliant um i've got another question i was thinking well while you were talking about the the big name serial killers that i can think of were all operating during the 50s to the 70s and a lot in the 70s so like gein manson the zodiac killer bundy berkowitz gacy and so forth and so and i was thinking about um i thought it's really interesting the way you're talking about the discourse uh from uh feeding uh, uh, the, the slasher discourse feeding how we understand uh, serial killers and so forth and then i was thinking about the the 21st century equivalent and there i was imagining luca magnotta before meg uh, mentioned him so i was wondering whether you think that the discourses that you were talking about around the serial killer extend forward beyond that period after the 70s um whether the discourse surrounding films starts to feed the serial killer discourse and so forth and um whether the same proposals apply to the 21st century killer such as luca magnus or whether something's changed what's really interesting uh, is the fact that like in canada we don't have a lot of serial killers probably because we just have such a small population but we do have really infamous people like luca magnus who only killed one person but sort of gets the same acclaim and media attention as though he were a serial killer. Um, and it's also true of, of Paul Bernardo, who uh, some people will be familiar with, um, which also then ties into the feminist movement because in the 1980s, um, there was uh, something like 40 or 50 rapes in the Scarborough Park. And so there was the Scarborough rapist and nobody knew who it was. And there was a whole panic um, and so there's a lot of feminist organizing against that in the name of like women's access to public spaces. Um, and then eventually when he was caught for the, for the kidnap and murder of two, two young schoolgirls, they realized through DNA that it was, he was also the Scarborough rapist. Um, and so he's serving indefinite time in prison as a dangerous offender, but his wife took a plea deal, um, basically claiming that she was a battered spouse um, and testified against Bernardo and it's only served 14 years and there was huge and continues to be huge backlash against the fact that they later found tapes that really implicated her as, a, as an active party in the torture and murder of, of these girls including her sister um, and so there's been like at least one movie made about about her um, and she's like had to leave the country because the news like hunted her down after she was released and her name changed and there was a lot of pushback against the fact that she got a university degree while she was serving time um in the women's prison in kingston and so yeah she's she's very vilified and i think there is that trend where there's something particularly heinous about women who commit violence in a way that there isn't when it's white dudes brilliant thank you um we've just lost a dt again oh great you're back brilliant um, because I was just going to say, <laughs> Dita has got uh, disconnected a moment ago. Um, so I want to return to the, the point we raised earlier about the Viennese actionists and uh, Tom Six. Um, since since then, Tom Watson's um, pointed out that there's definitely a link between the scatological humour of Tom Six and uh, filmmakers such as Otto Mule. Uh, so would you like to um, come back to that, Aditi? Yeah, yeah, so definitely there is a link. There is a, a similarity in uh, the scatological use, uh, uh, the scatology of Tom Six's movies and the use of uh, 
urine and entrails and blood and even shed by uh, Viennese actionists in their art. And also that both Tom Six's uh, grotesque sequences, as if you may, and also the performances of the Viennese, action, Viennese actionists were controlled and orchestrated. So yeah, there definitely is similarity, and but the difference lies in their intent. While uh, Tom Six's movies are have are, are just for the sake of art. He is a filmmaker who enjoys making films, right? And uh, as uh, as a Viennese actionist, their art was more directed towards the Austrian government. It was more of them expressing their anger towards the government. So there are definitely similarities between the uh, between Tom Six's art and uh, the Viennese actions. Sure. I suppose, like, do you get the impression that Tom Six has a particular target in mind? Because as you've ju you've just pointed out, the Viennese actionists are talking to the government uh, or uh, making comments about political oppression. Does Tom Six have the same kind of agenda, or is he just provoking? For the uh, sake of provoking, so anyone can read it however they want to. Especially with his upcoming film, uh, it's most expressly about this increasing trend of political correctness in filmmaking in and of itself. So he sort of wants to show that film doesn't necessarily have to be politically correct and you can sort of push the boundaries and do whatever the absolute hell you want to. He says, I know what the visionary fuck I'm doing. He, so he is sort of that uh, self-obsessed person who sort of I won't really say self-obsessed, but there's this uh, sense of celebration towards his own work. It's like he he takes pride in the fact that he does what no one else dares to do, if I can put it that way. That reminds me of something that um, Lloyd Kaufman said yesterday during his, I mean, he was joking when he was saying it, but he was saying that he took the kind of um, auteurist route, uh, but he framed himself as a uh, self-obsessed narcissistic filmmaker. Obviously he was joking, but I think he's doing something fairly similar, but especially within his, his uses of humor. And partly I wonder whether what Tom Six is doing is drawing on some of the ways that say postmodern slasher filmmakers start to start to inflect in on themselves, but at the same time started to think about what they were doing as filmmakers and whether what Tom Six is doing is just a natural extension of that, as it were. Brilliant. I think we're just about at time. So I just I've just got to say thank you very much to our panelists for uh, your wonderful papers that, as I say, were very close to my heart. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Erica, Meg, uh, Eloite, and Aditi. Um, I, that was fantastic. And thank you so much again, Steve, uh, for uh, coming back to chair that panel.